Hello, my name is Ken Eldridge and I'm one of the senior developers at Open Automation Software. I would like to share with you today 10 things that I think your data historian should implement and perform. One of the most important things is to log the data in an open format. This way you'd be able to use third-party report products and your own report tools to access that data and also tie in with third-party database systems or your own custom database engines easily with open connectivity. Another important thing is that there's no data loss when there's a network failure or a database engine failure. Your data is important to you and you don't want to have that data come up missing when you have uh, an outage of a network failure or if the database engine itself is not reachable. Also, it's important to be able to log up to a million values per second with 100 nanosecond resolution. Now, in your system, you may not need to log 1 million values each second, but you want to make sure that your system can be scalable and be able to support bursts of data coming in with no data loss. And you don't want to have your system become bogged down if it uh, gets caught up uh, backed up with too much data being able to be processed. And it's important that the data is timestamped correctly from the data source and be able to carry that timestamp all the way from the data source to its final destination. It's also important that the system be able to be scalable and be able to log to more than 10,000 separate tables and multiple database engines from the same central server. The data historian should be able to integrate directly with your existing SCADA system or your .NET application that you've developed. The data historian should be able to log data based upon event based upon change, based upon uh, an emergency condition to be able to go back in time and capture all of the events and data up to that point, and also continuously in a, either a wide or narrow table format. Networking should be easy to implement. It should be able to support your local area network, wide area network, and also internet communications. The system should support automatic setup for quick deployment. If you've got millions of data points that you need to set up, you couldn't possibly do it if you have to manually set that up. So you might want to have either a programmatic interface, uh, CSV import. Uh, these changes you'd want to be able to support also while the system is running. And you want to be able to connect to multiple data sources, not just a proprietary uh, driver. With opcdatabase.net, we can do all of these things. And I'm going to, in this video, I will show you uh, it in action. With opcdatabase.net, we can bring in data from multiple data sources, such as Microsoft Excel, binary files, from other databases that are from SQL Server, Oracle, Access, and MySQL, from .NET applications, and that's probably the most powerful data source because this opens the door to all kinds of uh, information systems, uh, management systems, maintenance tracking systems, custom data, both locally and remotely with either web services, Windows services. And we also support interface directly from your smartphone. So you could have data coming from uh, either an Android or iPhone device or an iPad. With a jQuery interface, you can inject data into the real-time database engine. Data is also commonly brought in from OPC servers, such as Kepware, with drivers for Allen Bradley, Siemens, GE, Modbus, and also from your third-party SCADA systems using opcclient.net. We can either directly connect to those as an OPC server or as an OPC client. The data can then be logged to database engines like SQL Server, Oracle, Access, MySQL, and also to CSV files. I'm going to demonstrate for you product in action and show you how easy it is to set up using our one-click OPC feature and one-click database feature. I've started the configure OPC systems application and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a group called OPC data. This group name can be anything that you would like. And then I'm going to use the one-click OPC feature and I've set up the Kepware OPC server to have 10,000 tags set up under simulation under device one. So what I'll do is I'll select add tags and it will go to the OPC server, inquire what items are there and add them into the real-time database. There it shows we've added 10,007 tags into the system. There are a few uh, system tags that Kepware adds into their device driver. 
So now if we start runtime, we can expand the OPC data group with the specific channel. And there we have all of the tags imported directly from Kepware. That just took a few seconds. And there we have the live data coming from the Kepware OPC server. Now we're going to use the one-click database feature by going to configure data logging. And here I'll select one-click database. I'll specify a tag group within the real-time OPC system service. I'll just select OPC data. And here I'm going to get the local data. We'll just specify to log that data continuously and to this database engine. The database engine could be local or remote. I'll just specify a new table name called local data. Next, I can also optionally specify to set up CSV logging. We'll select finish. And it's added these logging groups. We're logging this data in a wide table format where we've mapped specific field names to specific tags in the real-time service. As they change values, we index them in and record them at a one second interval. Now the data resolution that we have is 100 nanosecond. If we need to support that in SQL Server, you would include also a microsecond field and a nanosecond field. This data would typically come from a .NET application where we can include the timestamps of when the data is recorded. And data is queued and processed in the order that it's received, but properly indexed when we're logging data at a continuous rate at one second. The other types that you can do uh, are event-driven, where you can specify a tag to trigger that data logging group. The snapshot recording will go back in time after an event occurs and capture all of the data that previously occurs before that. And you can also log at a specific time of day. And you can do all of these in either wide or narrow table format. Now let's take a look at that data in the database using the SQL Server Management Studio. I'll expand databases and I see the new database called Local Data. I see that we have new tables. Let's, let, let's right click on one of those tables and query that. And there we can see we can have a simple query statement. I can say select star from table and it will return the data. It's in an open format. There we have the data being recorded with the proper timestamp. Now let me demonstrate what happens if we have a network failure or a database engine failure. Under the configure application, we have configure options. And to set up the data buffering to disk, we just go to the data buffer tab. And it's just that simple to select store data logging buffer to disk and the directory that we would like these files to be stored in when we have a database engine failure or network failure. And the data buffering occurs both at the data source uh, when we're doing remote networking, which I'll show you in a moment, and also on a database engine failure, which I'll show you now. So if we go to the SQL Server Management Studio, and if we simply stop the database engine, with the database engine now stopped, we should be buffering that data to our local uh, hard disk in that drive and directory that I specified, which was C colon backslash buffer. And there I see I already have some files being logged into that. Now the files are just small binary files. We're logging a lot of data right now to one second interval, but you can see the file size themselves are very small. They're very compact. Also the data going to the database itself after it gets there is as small as it possibly can be. We don't have to log a bunch of additional binary data to index where the data is because it's already logged in an open format and it's easily accessible that way. So as the system goes along, it would buffer this data to disk and so that you may have a network outage that maybe lasts for days or months. You wouldn't lose any of that data and we'll see in a moment when we start the database engine back up that it will process the data one file at a time not to overwhelm your network when the database engine comes back alive or the network comes back alive. And let's take a look at the local time that we have here. So it's at uh, 12, 24 and 30 seconds so we want to make sure that we have data at that time and just before that and after continuously all the way through that time that the database engine has been down. So now what we'll do is we'll start the database engine back up. 
Now if we go back to that buffer directory, we'll see that some of these files are now being processed out. They're being processed one file at a time for each database connection. Database connections actually run in parallel in this scenario, so all of the data logging groups are running in parallel with each other at the same time. So that's why the database files are actually being processed fairly quickly to the database engine. Again, not to overwhelm the network or the database engine, but when that last file disappears, we'll know that all of the data has been restored back to the database engine with the proper timestamps. Now let's go take a look at that data. We'll make a new query to that uh, OPC data table. Select to new query. We'll execute that. And if we scroll down to the time, which is 12, 24, and 30 seconds, we should have a record there with that timestamp. And yes, there it is right there. And so that is uh, the data buffering uh, demonstrated where we don't have data lost even if your database engine uh, has a failure or is not reachable. Now we would also be able to buffer data if we're connecting to a remote service and that could even be over the internet. There are four types of networking scenarios that you might run into with your data historian. We just demonstrated local data going to a local database engine, but your database engine may be on a remote system as well. And that is no problem with the OPC database.net data historian, because what happens is they, the calls that are made to the database engine are the same, uh, just basically being able to pass multiple records all in one call at the same time, that no data will get backed up even if the database engine is remote. Also with the data buffering feature that we just demonstrated, if the network drops out, data can also be buffered at the local data source. Another type of networking scenario is remote data with a fixed IP address at the data source. And that's very easy to do. You might have a registered domain name for the internet, or you have a fixed IP address for the internet or your wide area network and you simply access and connect to that data directly. Let me show you that just real quickly with the configure application, how it would be done manually. If I were to add a new login group, or maybe I could just take one of these existing ones to show you, I would add a point and instead of selecting a uh, local host, I would select an IP address or a network node name. And here I'm just gonna select a registered domain name of a service that's uh, registered on the internet and I could select uh, this particular Boolean variable. And uh, with opcsystems.net, you can see there's a lot of different parameters that you can access, but the most common thing is the value. So there, that's what you would specify as the tag name uh, is to include double backslash and then the IP address or registered domain name and then backslash and then the tag and value. Another type of scenario is that if you had remote data with a dynamic IP address and you were logging that data to a central server. In this scenario, we would have the data logging engine point to remote tags using a feature with opcdatabase.net. We can do this uh, using the live data cloud feature. And that's a free networking product that we include with the data historian. And the fourth scenario, you might have remote data with a dynamic IP address using the live data cloud feature. And you may be logging data to remote distributed services. And that's what I'm gonna demonstrate for you right now. In this scenario, I have my data currently located on my laptop and it, I'm currently located here in Australia. And I have my local Kepware OPC server talking to my real-time OPC system service and it's providing that data. Now what I'm going to demonstrate for you is to send that data out to a central uh, hosted server that has a fixed IP address and that is located in the United States. And then I can log that data anywhere in the world that I would choose to from any other data logging engine. So it might be in Europe or uh, China. Um, in this particular scenario, to make it easy, I'm just going to log it right back on my laptop 
uh, located here in Australia. So I'm going to go through that entire scenario, how that's done. It's just going to take me just a few minutes to show you that, how that's done. So the first thing that I would do is I would use the Live Data Cloud feature under Configure Live Data Cloud. I'll select the local service and I see that I'm hosting my computer and I've named it Ken's underscore PC and I'm hosting that through opcsystems.com. Now if you want to do your own demonstration, um, just contact us. We can then authorize your hosting name through our server or you can set up your own Live Data Cloud. No, just download the software at opcsystems.com and then visit the website livedatacloud.com to see how to set this up. And this is all the steps that there is to it, really. Um, the next thing is we're going to go to our data logging engine. Oh, we also see this flashing indication. That's also a good way, opportunity for me to demonstrate to you that uh, when something goes wrong, we can send email notifications using the OPC Alarm product. We can call you on the phone, send you a text message. Uh, anytime that data buffering has uh, started or stopped, we can record when that occurred. If you remember back when we stopped the database engine, those were problems for those data logging groups being able to uh, be able to record data uh, to that. I'll use the one-click database feature again to set up the data logging. This time when I browse for the tag group, what I can do is I can actually reach out using the opcsystems.com. When I select that service, it's actually going to show me the available live data cloud nodes hosted off of that server in the United States. I'll then select my PC, that is the live data cloud node, and there I can select the OPC data group that's on my PC. Then it auto filled in the network node and the live data cloud node that I want to be able to connect to. The group name, I'll make this one a little bit different this time. I'll just call it live data cloud. I'll select next. This time to show you the accuracy of the data being delivered, I'm going to choose data change row so that we can see the timestamps of each of the data values being recorded. And we're going to have a still a wide table format. I could also use a narrow table format which would log the individual tag names along with the values and timestamps. With the data change row I can specify a dead band if I would want to. Next I'll log this to SQL Server to my local database engine into the database We'll make a new one this time called Live Data Cloud. We'll select Next and Finish. And it's now added the data logging groups for Live Data Cloud. If we could come in here to the Tags tab, let's take a look at one of these field names that it's added. And there's the network node name of the hosted server, opcsystems.com. We're using remote SCADA hosting to Ken's PC to the tag group OPC data, channel 10K, and there we have the particular tag name from the Kepware OPC server. And we see that it also brought back the uh, data type for us to log that value. So that was all done over the internet uh, using the live data cloud feature. And now let's take a look at that data in the SQL Server Management Studio. Now let's just make a query to one of these tables. Let's just select the top 1,000 rows out of this table. And there we see the data that's being recorded, uh, each with the uh, tags from the Kepware OPC Server simulation. Each of those 10,000 tags use the same simulation type of a ramp signal that ranges, that just simply increments by one for each value. And there we see the timestamp for those values that uh, Kepware sent to us over the internet from my system here in Australia to the central server in the United States and then I am logging that data back uh, to my system here. And, we, and we're seeing that we're able to maintain the tight resolution on the timestamp even though we're going across the internet for the data logging. If you'd like to try these features of the opcdatabase.net data historian, visit the website opcsystems.com. From the home page, select Download Now at the top, 
and it'll take you to a download page where you can download the software and there's step-by-step -step instructions on how to set up the tags with one-click OPC that I demonstrated and the one-click database feature that I also demonstrated.